dando inicio a esta última audiencia de la mañana y última audiencia del año también en esta sala, que está referida al seguimiento de las recomendaciones formuladas por el informe de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos sobre eh, las solicitudes de asilo en Canadá. Eh, entiendo que por el, la sociedad civil eh, están presentes la Asociación Americana de Juristas, eh, Abogados de Derechos Humanos, también la Interchurch Committee for Refugees y también Canadian eh, Centro for las Víctimas de la Tortura. Eh, agradecemos también la presencia de la delegación del Estado, encabezada por la señora embajadora. Eh, para el desarrollo de esta audiencia, cada una de las partes tendrá una intervención inicial de hasta 15 minutos. Luego habrá una intervención de los comisionados. Nos acompaña el comisionado James Cavallaro, eh, relator para Canadá, la secretaria ejecutiva adjunta, Elizabeth Abimashar, yo soy Francisco Iguren, presidente de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos. Eh, y bueno, eh, después de esas intervenciones o preguntas nuestras, podrán las partes tener una nueva intervención por el tiempo que eh, fijaremos en su momento según la disponibilidad prevista. Entonces, yo haré indicación con unos carteles cuando falten 5, 3 y 1 minuto para la presentación. Entonces, doy la palabra a la sociedad civil para que inicie su presentación hasta por 15 minutos, eh, agradeciendo que la persona que haga uso de la palabra pues se identifique, indicando su nombre y la organización a la que pertenece para efecto de la grabación. Gracias. Adelante. Good morning. I'm Tom Clark. For almost 20 years I was the coordinator for the then Interchurch Committee for Refugees linked to the Canadian Council of Churches. And I'm pleased to join Stuartist Banfi, an attorney from Montreal, Sarah Boyd, an attorney with Jackman Nazami and Associates in Toronto, and Izat Molassanajad, Canadian Centre for Victims of Torture, also in Toronto. And I bring some background. In 1989, the Council of Churches challenged the constitutionality of, the, of a new Immigration Act before the courts. In 1992, the Supreme Court said there were legal issues, but refugee claimants should put them before the courts. In 1992, I sent Mrs. Joseph's case, the first Canadian complaint to the Commission, and it was about deportation, family separation, and due process. We learned that judicial review was to be tried. Other cases followed. In 1996, a general hearing was held, an on-site visit followed, and your 2000 report issued. Things changed. We had terrorists, but also we had the final report in 2003 on human rights and non-citizens from the then UN Subcommission on Human Rights, with its focus on non-discrimination, something that was picked up internationally, and in your case, law, involving the report on the United States and immigration. <coughs> It's the consequence of that last hearing and on-site visit that made me want to be here today. The on-site visit played a hugely positive role in raising awareness of the Commission and its work and the naming of Canada's human rights obligations. You listed this hearing today, Mr. President, as a follow-up on recommendations we have reviewed your recommendations from 2000, and you have a report from Sarah Boyd on our behalf. Our list of issues for today covers them and updates the situation. You have written material. Let me skim some of the issues. The item two on our agenda to you, access to a substantive refugee hearing, still not available for every refugee claimant. Item four on our list. There is now a refugee appeal, but only for new evidence of a certain type, and some refused refugee claimants cannot use it. The two administrative processes, pre-removal risk assessment 
and an application for humanitarian and compassionate grounds remain for many refused and excluded, but not all. They do not suspend deportation. Under item 5, your family reunification concerns for recognized refugees still bring delays and new requirements have brought new hardships. Item 6 is detention. Yes, we still have detention issues. Item 7, family rights and children's rights in deportation remain just factors to be bundled with others by administrative decision makers. My colleagues will elaborate. My name is Stuart Esfanti with the Asociación Americana de Juristas, and my uh, intervention will be relatively narrowly focused on the recourses which are available to avoid deportation to torture or death or serious persecution. And uh, the family rights questions will be followed up uh, by my colleague beside me. I've been involved in these issues for uh, the last quarter century or so. I was at the Inter-American Human Rights Commission when there was the uh, thematic hearing, I was there to present a case before the Commission. And since then, I have participated at the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations, Committee Against Torture of the United Nations, presented uh, documents there. Uh, and there's constantly an issue of whether there is uh, a access to a valid recourse to enforce the substantive rights of not being removed to torture or to death. And uh, I am going to paraphrase my most recent submissions to the Human Rights Committee of the United, Station, United Nations from July 2015. Uh, I would start by saying we believe that there aren't really effective mechanisms for enforcing charter rights or international obligations in the immigration or non-citizen context. Uh, we've been following this question of the treatment of refugees and immigrants before the Canadian courts and for the Committee Against Torture and the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations for over a quarter of a century. Uh, this is particularly evident with regard to asylum seekers and refugees and the international rights against refoulement to serious threats to life and death, but is also true of the respect of uh, the duty to protect the family life of foreign nationals and the effective consideration of the rights of children in deportation decisions. The existing administrative and judicial recourses are hardly making any reference to Canada's international law obligations in their decisions, and there's not really any effective recourse to enforce these obligations, as is required by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Convention Against Torture. We are particularly concerned with the prohibition of return to a substantial risk of torture or to other kinds of life-threatening situations, which is prohibited in the Human Rights Committee's comments on Articles 6 and 7 of the Covenant. In general, the Canadian authorities do not have the political will to correct mistakes, even in front of the strongest kind of new evidence, and the judicial review before the federal court is not enforcing this obligation in a clear and effective fashion. Administrative convenience and the desire for finality appear to have trumped the need for an effective control over these types of administrative decisions. It's also clear that the interpretation of the prohibition of return to probable torture, which is referred to in the Covenant in Article 3 of the Convention Against Torture, is not being done in alignment with the international jurisprudence on these questions. There is no reference at all in the jurisprudence to the second paragraph of Article 3 of the Convention Against Torture, which refers to the existence in the state concern of a consistent pattern of gross, flagrant, or mass violations of human rights. In reality, there is almost no reference to international law this century in the jurisprudence of the federal court, the main court which should be exercising judicial control over the administration of these types of decisions. This is a domain of law where international law is particularly important and provides the legal framework for very important rights. The pre-removal risk assessment and administrative recourse at the end of the process is clearly not a procedure that is effective in protecting deportees from serious violations of international law. And it clearly does not have the guarantees of independence and impartiality that would provide minimal judicial guarantees. Unfortunately, the federal court is not seen to intervene on these decisions, except on a minority of cases. There is a substantial body of jurisprudence in the context of judicial stays of deportation, which says that new evidence does not really matter if it refers to the original allegations 
judged not to be credible in the applicant's refugee story. There has been some serious criticism of the effectiveness of both the administrative and legal procedures to protect fundamental rights under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms or under our international law obligations from both the Human Rights Committee and the Committee Against Torture, but this has not resulted in any kind of serious debate on the part of the political or judicial authorities. The kind of dialogue that is supposed to take place between the international tribunal and the domestic state authorities has not really taken place. So we're in a situation where the main obligations in international law with regards to deportation to substantial risk are not being enforced either in the administrative context and in a very lackadaisical fashion in the judicial context. And I'll give the opportunity to my colleague. Thank you. I'm going to speak as briefly as I can about the family reunification issues, um, issues with deportation for very minor, uh, relatively minor criminal records, and also with um, detention, which uh, remains an issue. The 2000 report was concerned about delays in the granting of permanent residence. There are three categories in Canada. If you are accepted as a refugee, you a protected person, also if you're accepted as a person at risk of torture or mistreatment or death. Then you apply for permanent residence, then you can apply for citizenship. So a person may be found to be a protected person but not obtain permanent residence and therefore not be able to proceed to citizenship. Uh, at the time, refugees, accepted refugees had only 180 days. They uh, have done away with that arbitrary provision, which is an improvement, but there are still delays in family reunification. Theoretically, a protected person can include their immediate family members when they apply, and they should be processed in parallel, but processing takes one to five to two years. Adult children and parents are not included. There's no provision for family members to come to Canada in the interim if they are in a situation of risk. There's no express provision to prevent the removal of family members from Canada where the family made a claim together, but usually owing to a different country of residence, only some of the family members are accepted. In practice, they're rarely removed, but it, it's only a matter of, of policy. The applications of overseas family members are assessed by visa posts in the country of persecution, and there are uh, significant and multiple problems with that. And persons accepted as refugees but denied permanent residence have no route to family reunification. The family members of refugees continue to be affected by other issues with the system, such as the changes to the definition of serious criminality. Uh, it used to be the case that persons in Canada who had a serious criminal record, um, meaning were convicted of a crime for which there was a possible maximum penalty of 10 years, could appeal on humanitarian and compassionate grounds if their sentence was uh, two years or less. That was changed to six months, and until a very recent Supreme Court decision, even a sentence of six months in the community would render someone deportable, regardless of their family connections in Canada or if they'd lived in Canada their entire life. In terms of uh, detention, I will just briefly mention that uh, it remains a serious problem, largely because of detainees uh, being warehoused in provincial jails for long periods of time where the conditions have been found to be cruel and unusual in some cases and because there is no political will or motivation on the part of the agencies involved in detaining to actually work with the person or with counsel to come up with a release plan. And I will now turn it over to my colleague. Good afternoon. My name is Ezrat uh, Musallonjot. I work with the Canadian Centre for Victims of Torture. Uh, it is a non-government charitable organization that helps survivors of torture, uh, war, genocide, and crimes against humanity to overcome uh, everlasting effects of uh, their trauma. Since it, uh, its inception in 1977, our center has provided the ho uh, holistic services to over 24,000 survivors of torture from 136 countries. We are particularly interested in a strict prohibition of torture 
prevention of torture, uh, the principle of non-reformation to torture, and specifically uh, rehabilitation of survivors. Uh, I'm going to share with you today the plight of non-citizens uh, in limbo in Canada. The term, lim the term limbo uh, denotes any place or condition of uncertainty, instability, or being taken for granted. Based on our documentation about the global perpetration of torture, limbo is used as an actual technique of torture by torturers, war criminal, criminals, and perpetrators of genocide. Unfortunately, there are certain gaps in immigration, refugee, and, immigra uh, and uh, uh, legislation and practices that keep non-citizens in limbo. We have been uh, serving uh, survivors in limbo coming from different countries. Let me share one example uh, with you. Uh, this woman survivor came to Canada along with her husband 31 years back. They deemed them inadmissible due to their membership in an agency that is no longer in the terrorist list of Canada. Uh, she doesn't have access to health uh, benefits. She doesn't have work permit. She doesn't have uh, permission to study. Uh, they suffer in silence. Their citizens, uh, their children got, were born in Canada. They got Canadian citizenship, uh, and, but parents are still in limbo. Uh, days and nights passes, and their physical and psychological uh, conditions get worsened and worsened, and they have to live between fear and hope. Uh, so what uh, there are Mm, uh, there are hundreds of cases of non-citizens in Canada, in limbo. There are vulnerable women, youth, and senior citizens. People are limbo due to various reasons, including uh, government security obsessions and alleged or real criminality. People in limbo suffer from family separation, and ch their children suffer in silence due to lack of any status. Uh, while we endorse the Canadian government's global campaign against terrorism, we are concerned about its excessive measures of post-September 11. There is a need for, the, for genuine eff effort by the government to reform its domestic legislations and practices concerning implementation of the fundamental rights of humankind. We strongly request Canada to ratify optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture and 1954 UN Convention on the Protection of Stateless People. We are particularly concerned about uh, keeping non-citizens in immigration limbo indefinitely. Let me share some of our positive experiences in this area. A Sri Lankan client of the uh, center received uh, his permanent resident status in Canada after languishing in limbo for 41 years and an Iranian after 20 years. This means that it is possible for the government to remedy the anguish of people who suffer in silence because of being in prolonged immigration limbo. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Eh, la palabra ahora para al Estado. Sí, señora embajadora. Thank you very much and good afternoon, commissioners, and uh, good afternoon to the petitioners as well. My name is Jennifer Lowton, and I am Canada's permanent representative to the Organization of American States. I'd like to begin by thanking the petitioners for sharing their concerns about human rights implications in Canada's asylum system and related programs, but also for being champions of a rights-based approach to good policy. I want to thank you all for your long years of work and service. Government, good government is a partnership, and we count on the role that you all play every day to advance these important issues. Canada has a proud humanitarian tradition. Providing protection to refugees is part of this tradition. The objectives of Canada's refugee programs reflect our obligations under international conventions on protection, such as the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees, 
and the 1984 Convention Against Torture and Domestic Law, such as the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. Canada has a world-class immigration and asylum system that has at its heart respect for human rights. In essence, Canada's asylum system works to uphold our commitment to the principle of non refoulement Persons should not be removed to a country where they would be at risk of persecution, torture, risk to life, or risk of cruel and unusual treatment or punishment. It also reflects the obligation under domestic law to provide every eligible asylum claim a fair hearing before an independent Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada, which is an independent quasi-judicial tribunal. The IRB decides whether an asylum claimant meets the United Nations definition of, con of a convention refugee or is a person in need of protection. Each case is always decided on its own merit. <clears throat> Those who are not eligible to have their claim heard by the IRB or whose claims are rejected by the IRB and time has passed since their last decision can still apply for protection in Canada through the pre-removal risk assessment so that we can be sure that such individuals do not face, face risk of harm upon return to their home country. Just like other signatories to those two conventions, the strategic objectives of the in-Canada asylum system are either to grant protection and a pathway to permanent residence to those in need of protection, or to allow to depart or remove those found not in need of protection. Before reforms implemented in 2012, Canada's asylum system was under pressure. People in genuine need of protection had to wait about 18 months for a protection decision. This was a long time for those genuine <coughs> refugees who faced uncertainty during this timeline. Those not in need of protection also had access to multiple recourses and delays to their departure. It took an average of four and a half years to remove failed claimants. Since the changes to the system, Processing time for asylum claimants have been significantly shorter compared to those before the measures were implemented. On average, it is taking five months for the Refugee Protection Division of the IRB to finalize scheduled claims from the date the claims are made. Acceptance rates have also increased at the IRB. In the three years before the reform, the acceptance rate was 37%, whereas now it's risen to 65%. As part of the reforms, the Refugee Appeal Division at the IRB was also created. This appeal body permits most asylum claimants whose claim is rejected to appeal against negative decisions of the Refugee Protection Division. As in most common law countries, negative asylum decisions can also be reviewed by the federal court in Canada. As I mentioned earlier, individuals who are not eligible to have their claim heard by the IRB or whose claims are rejected and their decisions are old may still avail themselves of a pre-removal risk assessment, a PRRA. Based on Canada's domestic and international commitments to non refoulement the PRRA helps ensure that individuals are not removed to a country where they would be at risk of persecution, of torture, risk to life, or cruel or unusual treatment or punishment. For eligible applicants, the PRRA is the last opportunity for a foreign national to seek refugee protection before their removal order is executed. Senior immigration officers at Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada are responsible for conducting PRRAs. And while primarily a paper-based assessment of risk, oral hearings may be held when there are credible concerns that are central to the decision. Canada's legislation is specific in regards to the evidence that may be assessed in a PRRA application. In cases where the application had a refugee hearing before the IRB, the PRRA is restricted to new evidence that arose after the rejection or evidence that was not reasonably available at the time of the rejection. In the cases where there has never been a previous risk determination, such as individ individuals who are ineligible to have a claim heard before the IRB, senior immigration officers base their determination of risk on any written evidence that the applicant may wish to present for consideration. Like IRB decision makers, the IRCC officers receive extensive training, operation instruction, coaching and mentoring on the standard of proof and the assessment of and weighing of evidence. Evidence is not considered in isolation. Instead, officers are instructed to examine and consider all of the evidence as a whole. The onus is on the applicant to provide objective factual material 
that demonstrates a probability of danger to the applicant if returned to the country of origin. It's important to note that a PRRA application is not an appeal of a negative refugee claim decision, but rather an assessment based on new facts or evidence. Persons not excluded under the Refugee Convention whose PRRA applications are accepted become protected persons. They may then apply to become a permanent resident. If a PRRA application is rejected, the applicant's removal order comes back into force and they must leave Canada. The most recent PRRA acceptance rates have been approximately 8%. This is reasonable given that a great majority of applicants have already had their claim heard by the IRB within the past few years. I would like now to take this opportunity to outline Canada's policy with respect to immigration detention and removals, including measures and considerations for children and families. Canada takes seriously its human rights and humanitarian protection obligations, as well as its obligations to protect the health, safety and security of Canadians. These values underlie Canada's immigration system, including the laws and policies governing removals and immigration detention. Canada is very proud of its model, whereby the Immigration Division of the IRB, a quasi-judicial tribunal, is responsible for ensuring that there are continued grounds for the government to continue detention. As well, Canada does not have a blanket policy of detaining asylum claimants simply for making their claims or for entering illegally. Under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, officers from the Canada Border Service Agency have the authority to detain foreign nationals and permanent residents where there are reasonable grounds to believe the person is inadmissible to Canada and if the officer has reasonable grounds to believe that the individual is a danger to the public, is unlikely to appear for immigration processes, is unable to satisfy the officer of the identity of a foreign national other than in the case of a protected person, or if it is necessary to complete an examination or investigation. Canada is committed to carrying out detention in accordance with fundamental procedural safeguards, and detainees' rights are guaranteed by the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Individuals who are detained for immigration purposes are protected from arbitrary detention and have access to effective remedies. As part of this commitment, on November 6, 2017, the Honourable Ralph Goodell, Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, issued a ministerial direction on the treatment of minors in Canada's immigration detention system. The key objective of this was, as much as possible, to keep children out of detention and to keep families together. The ministerial direction makes it clear that it is in the best interest of the child and those must be given primary consideration. In the event that an individual is arrested or detained, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms requires that a CBSA officer inform the individual of the reasons for their arrest and detention and their right to legal representation and their right to notify a representative of their government if they have been arrested or detained, so they can seek consular services if desired. Canadian officials will only detain an individual where doing so is necessary and proportional to all circumstances. The CBSA officers must consider reasonable alternatives to detention when arresting or detaining an individual. In fact, CBSA relies on a variety of alternative measures to detention where these are appropriate. Canada is committed to the equitable application of immigration laws and in a manner that reflects Canadian values, especially when it comes to the removal of inadmissible individuals from Canada. In accordance with legislation, the CBSA has an obligation to remove persons who are not entitled to remain in Canada as soon as possible. Everyone ordered removed is entitled to due process before the law, and all removal orders are subject to various levels of appeal. Prior to removal, the person may seek leave for judicial review at the federal court, and as previously mentioned, the individual may also be entitled to submit an application for pre-removal risk assessment at the IRCC. Also, as I mentioned, Canada recognizes the, important, the importance of promoting and safeguarding the rights of children, both in Canada and abroad, and works closely with other levels of government, law enforcement authorities, and intergovernmental organizations to ensure that decisions on behalf of children are made in consideration of their best interests and in accordance with Canadian law and regulations. Every effort is made to keep family units intact, and the best interests of the child is considered even when removal is imminent. Most minor children that are returned to their countries of origin are accompanied by family members who are also returning to their home. The decision to remove someone from Canada is not taken lightly, and persons are dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. 
it is imperative for the integrity of Canada's immigration system that once all legal avenues of review are exhausted, a person subject to a removal order respect our laws and leave Canada or is removed. I will now turn to the subject of requests made by foreign nationals in Canada for humanitarian and compassionate consideration. It's important to note that humanitarian and compassion considerations are not part of Canada's asylum system and, inter and international obligations. It is instead a discretionary program that provides flexibility to grant permanent resident status in an exceptional cases basis on humanitarian and compassionate grounds, which I will refer to as H and C here forward. Foreign nationals who do not meet the eligibility requirements in an economic, family, or refugee immigration class may in most circumstances request H and C consideration. H and C consideration is not an immigration class, nor is it an appeal mechanism. Decisions have no eligibility criteria. Rather, applicants are assessed on, are assessed on a case-by-case -case basis by taking into account the personal circumstances of the applicant. Factors that are considered include, but are not limited to, the applicant's establishment in Canada, family relationships, the best interests of a child directly affected by the decision, and certain factors in the applicant's country of origin that are not assessed as part of the asylum system process such as medical inadequacies, general country conditions, discrimination, or other hardships. Individuals granted permanent residence on agency grounds are not considered to be refugees or persons in need of protection. The agency provision in Canada's immigration legislation requires that the best interests of a child directly affected must be considered. This applies to children under the age of 18 years in accordance with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. In assessing H and C submissions, the immigration officer must be alert and sensitive to the best interests of the children and should bear in mind, as children may experience greater hardship than adults faced with a com comparable situation, circumstances which may not warrant humanitarian and compassion relief when applied to an adult may nonetheless entitle a child to relief. The immigration officers examining requests for H and C considerations receive specialized training and guidelines on assessing the best interests of the child. Factors relating to a child's emotional, social, cultural, and physical welfare are taken into account when raised by the applicant. Furthermore, the relationship between the applicant and any child directly affected is not necessarily that of a, and not necessarily that of a parent and a child, but could be another relationship that is affected by the decision, for example, a grandparent who is a child's primary caregiver. It should be noted, however, that while the assessment of the best interests of a child must be given substantial weight, it does not mean that the interests of the child outweigh all other factors in the case. The approval of agency applications is based on a global assessment of all factors, both positive and negative, in every individual case. In 2016, approximately 6,900 agency applications were decided with an acceptance rate of 63%. I'd like to thank you for your time, and I look forward to responding to any questions that the Commission may have. And I would also like once again to reiterate my thanks and appreciation of the work done by our colleagues across the table representing civil society today. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, señora embajadora. Comisionado James Cavallaro, relator para Canadá. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Uh, and good afternoon to all uh, present. Uh, thank you very much for the information and for the clarifications. I have a few questions, and uh, I suspect that my colleagues will add more. So I'm just going to highlight two issues. One is uh, I, I will reiterate the question that I asked in the in the last session, uh, directed particularly at uh, Her Excellency the, the Representative uh, Ambassador Lowton, and that is on the narrow issue of deportations in contexts in which there is some international body which has issued a decision uh, that seeks to protect the person from deportation uh, and how what are the what are the bases what have been the bases for Canada's engagement in a way that is not consistent with those determinations and how can we move uh, to a legal and policy uh, uh, system in which that is not possible, in which that kind of deportation in 
disregard of an international determination of protection does not happen. <clears throat> and then, uh, with regard to the situation of children, children in detention, and uh, I'm actually going to say the words H and C, humanitarian and compassionate, or humanitarian and compassionate, because I think it's it's hard for me to imagine applying uh, humanitarian and compassionate criteria and still deciding that a child should be in detention. Uh, so I, I, I just, I don't see it, and I understand 63%, that's, that's, that's very good, it's a, it's a high rate. I, I'm thinking about the 37% of children in which the determination is that they should remain in detention. I, I can't see how that's a humanitarian or compassionate outcome. This, not, the 63 is the deportation, not for the detention. Okay. Okay, it's not for the children. So then, okay, thank you, uh, Elizabeth. So, in a situation in which there's a decision that the parent is going to be, or the parents are going to be deported, and there's a child, the question would be, what happens with the child? Does the child remain in detention with the parent? Is the child allowed to live in country with uh, another relative? And, and that's where there's, what, what, are, what is the legal or policy basis for making a decision about the child, and I understand family unification, et cetera. But I'm, I'm particularly concerned about detention of children and how that is addressed. Uh, that's all I have. There, may, I have a list of questions, but others will probably want to raise them. Uh, James, Elizabeth. <coughs> Thank you uh, to both parties for the presentation. Um, I remember the Commission's visit and report, and I remember that the Commission recognized very favorably the openness of Canada to the situation of refugees. And I also remember some of the issues that the Commission was looking at, as well as the, the matters that have come up in the intervening years. So forgive me if I'm out of date on asking a question, but one of the things I wanted to ask about is um, the question of the safe third, third country agreement whether that continues to be an issue of concern. I don't want to take much time, so I'm going to be brief. Um, one of the, the concerns that the Commission had, as from some years back, did have to do precisely with the deportation of foreign-born parents of Canadian-born children and the application of standards in the humanitarian and compassionate review. So we understand that those standards have changed somewhat over the years, but it would be interesting to know how in practice uh, the rights of the child are being observed in terms of jurisprudential standards or the criteria that are applied in the humanitarian and compassionate review. And we thank you for the information about the statistical change in terms of, of acceptance. It would be very useful to know to what extent are provincial jails being used or not used to detain, to house uh, persons in migration situations uh, in detention. And um, finally, one of the issues that the Commission has looked at has to do with the situation of people who've been certified as a risk to national security. And we understand that a change was made so that detention is no longer mandatory. We've also received some information about distinctions in treatment between certificate, um, those who've been classified under this certificate program, and other kinds of people in immigration detention or in detention processes. If there's time, it would be interesting to follow up on that. Thank you. Gracias. Ahora el Álvaro Botero de la Relatoría para Personas, Los Derechos de las Personas Migrantes, por favor. I would like also to thank both parties for your participation and all the information that you have provided to us. Uh, I would just add a, a few questions to the questions that were posed by Commissioner Cavallaro and Executive Secretary uh, Abby Marchette. Um, we would like to know what measures has been taken by the state uh, in order to ensure non-discrimination in immigration and asylum procedures. Um, we would also like to know a little bit more about what alternative to detention has been implemented by the Canadian state in recent years. And the last thing is, uh, according to the standards developed by the Inter-American system, 
how is the Canadian state guaranteeing the principle of non-detention of children uh, in immigration and asylum procedures? Uh, thank you. That will be all for me. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Claro. Eh, ahora tendrían la intervención cada una de las partes eh, hasta por cinco minutos y recibiremos lo que hasta aquí se pueda comentar y lo demás estaremos muy interesados en poderla recibir con información por, por escrito. Entonces doy la palabra hasta por cinco minutos a la sociedad civil. On the safe third country issue, yes, it's still a concern. It's being litigated currently. Um, and we see it as an issue of access to a substantive refugee hearing, which was your issue from last time, along with some of the discrimination issues of, you know, the eligibilities, the admissibilities, and what have you. Um, <coughs> I'm going to pass over to Sarah for the foreign-born parents and uh, native citizen children and deportations and how that plays out. And for the provincial jails, please. Um, regarding... Uh, regarding the position of Canadian-born children um, uh, with foreign parents being deported, uh, we do still have uh, birthright citizenship in Canada. But the government's position is traditionally that the child's right to be in Canada um, is not violated by the parent's deportation because the parent can leave them in Canada or they can return as an adult. Um, now that's the hardest line that they take and, and there are certainly cases where, you know, where the, it can be shown that the child's best interests are very um, heavily affected by uh, removal, then they will be allowed to stay, for example, on an H&C. &C. Um, this needs to be more robust, but I, I don't mean to suggest that they automatically deport uh, the children. Um, with regard to that, uh, and on the h &C, the Supreme Court's very recent decision on um, Kanthasami, uh, which was an agency of a young man there were uh, mental health issues and risk issues, and the Supreme Court clarified um, a great deal of the law, so I, I would certainly suggest uh, that it's a very useful read. Regarding detention in provincial jails, there are very few specialized immigration detention holding centers in Canada, and even where there are, so for example in Toronto, if a person has mental health issues, ironically, they are sent to the provincial jail. If a person has any history of criminality, they are sent to the provincial jail. Apparently, that's a result of a problem with the insurance at the Immigration Holding Center. Um, I would draw the Commission's attention to two decisions, uh, Ogimin versus Ontario, that's O-G-I-A-M-I-E-N, um, a 2016 decision of the Superior Court, and a 2017 uh, decision of the Court of Appeal overturning that. They can both be found on Canley. Uh, C-A-N-L-I-I dot org, which is uh, the best open source of uh, Canadian law. And they go into quite a bit of detail about the conditions in those jails to the extent that the lower court found uh, to be cruel and unusual, although this was overturned by the higher court. But it does give a good description of the circumstances in the provincial jails. I'll try and go very, very quickly here. On the PRA process, the pre-removal risk assessment, there's nobody uh, in terms of the Human Rights Committee in Canada that believes in the PRA as an effective recourse. It has been criticized quite strongly by judgments of the Committee Against Torture and the Human Rights Committee, which we are prepared to provide to the Commission. Uh, the rate of acceptance for most of its existence was about 2%. The current rate of overturning judgments at the Immigration Refuge Board Protection Division is about 25%. So about 10% uh, of the people who should have stayed probably didn't, looking at the figures of the recent Refugee Appeal Division. Uh, on the point of uh, 
deportation for family rights, I think it's important to underline that the Commission set out what is the international law on this point in paragraph 166 of the previous report, and which talked about that you shouldn't break up families unless there's a pressing need to protect public order, where means are proportional, and where the, the reasons justifying the interference with family life are very serious indeed. I would submit to this Commission that there are there is massive and systematic violation of those precepts of international law, particularly with young racialized minorities, especially young blacks who have been in Canada since they were nine or ten years old, and then they get one uh, criminal conviction and end up being deported to countries that they don't even know almost automatically by the current system. Uh, so uh, th this question of family rights and deportations, and particularly the lack of respect for uh, a proportionality in the context of criminality and deportations, it's a big issue. And I'll conclude there. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Y ahora la palabra para el Estado. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioners, and thank you again to the petitioners for the additional information. Th this is a very complex area of law, and I don't intend to, to uh, deal with it in any high-handed way. I will provide a, a few um, high-level responses to the specific questions you asked. For example, I'd like to make sure that uh, the committee is aware that reference was made in the petitioner's statements to the optional protocol on, against torture, and I just wanted to say that Canada has announced that we will adhere to that, that we have initiated the process to adhering to that optional protocol. So that's one piece of good news that I can share. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to mention is that in November, um, Ralph Goodell announced a ministerial directive on the treatment of minors in the Canadian immigration detention system. Um, and it's, he was following up and implementing the National Immigration Detention Framework, which was announced in August of 2016. $138 million were set aside to improve uh, immigration detention infrastructure. But I particularly want to draw attention to this because it does deal to alternatives to, de to detention. Some of these uh, include in-person reporting, cash or performance bonds, community supervision, voice reporting, other mechanisms of, of ensuring that we don't have only detention as a recourse. So simply to say that efforts are underway to improve and expand the system and that there are alternatives in play None of this, however, denies the fact that the universal commitment to ensure uh, humane treatment of, of human people, and particularly minors, is part of our system. Um, as far as the other specific questions are concerned, I will say that my colleagues are taking very detailed notes, and we would be happy to provide additional information. And again, I do want to underline this is a very uh, specific area of law that I want to be sure that Canada responds to accurately. And uh, given that it is not any area of my own personal expertise, uh, I don't I don't want to go any further at this time, but I will commit to ensuring that the responses that you need are provided uh, in a timely way. Thank you. Bueno, muchísimas gracias a la representación de la sociedad civil y del Estado, señora embajadora. Y demos por concluida entonces esta audiencia. Estaremos, como dije antes, interesados en dar seguimiento a este tema que tiene que ver con recomendaciones, implementación de recomendaciones de un informe de la CIDH y podremos recibir la información eh, con mucho interés. Very shortly, ¿sí? Because we are in the time. We just like to suggest that you follow up by another site visit, which was so helpful last time. Bueno, muchas gracias. Entonces, concluimos.